All right, uh, now we are ready to talk about Kubernetes observability with eBPF step by step. Let me quickly introduce our speakers. Uh, so he's Dini. Uh, he's the director of field engineering with Solo.io. Uh, a fun fact about Dini is all the demo he's going to demo today are all written by him, by himself. Um, I'm the director of open source with Solo.io. Uh, I'm a very long time contributor to the Istio project, one of the founding maintainer there. Um, a couple of fun facts of me, I recently become a CNCF ambassador. I also run a Hoot live stream every week to chat about um, Istio, Envoy, GraphQL, eBPF. A little bit about Solo, in case you don't know of our company, we are wearing our Solo shirts. Uh, it's founded by Edith Lavin, who sits right over there. Uh, our headquarters is in Boston, and we are the company specialized in IP, um, application networking, API connectivity, um, and also... Um, Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we are the industry leader in that space. We're growing really fast too, and we are hiring. Oh, so what is eBPF? Given this is eBPF day, we're not going to repeat to you what exactly is eBPF, but I want to share with you my learning journey about eBPF. First thing, uh, the, f the first four thing that really caught my eye when I started looking at eBPF last year, it's a sandbox environment and it's extended, right? Thomas talked about eBPF allow us to extend the kernel, like JavaScript allow us to extend uh, the web pages, right? And it has different hook points, which enables us to do the extension. And last not the least, it's supposed to be very safe. Like I mentioned to you, we have a strong background related to Istio and Envoy. When I look at eBPF, I'm connecting it to WebAssembly. How many of you know WebAssembly? Yeah, a few hands, right? So essentially what eBPF provides to the kernel is what WebAssembly provides uh, to Envoy proxy to allow you to extend the Envoy proxy to do your own customer uh, extension points, right? So eBPF have hook points, Envoy proxy has different faces for the proxy WASM, so you can extend your uh, WASM uh, binary into different faces. The, the next thing as a user I started looking at eBPF is why networking observability security, right, on the layer three and layer four. And this is very interesting. If you look at Istio and Envoy technology, you are seeing, you know, Istio Envoy is also solving the exact same category, but we're solving it a layer seven layer, right? Such as how do you do traffic shifting? How do you do uh, RBAC control, service level authorization? How do you do observability at layer seven? When I first started uh, learning eBPF, I started with BCC, uh, BPF compiler collection. How many of you actually wrote an eBPF program before? Yeah, a few of you, many hands. Very good. So this is a great toolkit to help me get started with my first program. But I find a couple of issues with this. First, uh, it's the user space program and the kernel program. They both written in Python. For me, I'm a Python developer. So the first thing I actually did is on um, Mac, I'm a Mac user. I tried to run that program, uh, Python Hello World .py. Of course, that didn't work, right? Because uh, you know it actually required the system have BP, uh, BPF program have the right kernel. It has needs to have the right kernel header. So finding the wrong time, it's actually it's a lot harder than I thought. I, I think I spent a few hours on this, and finally doing Google search, finally find a Wigram file that allows me to run my first Hello World program. The next thing I look at is uh, actually the presenter before 
Ross was talking about uh, Libby BPF and uh, compile once and run everywhere. How many of you love uh, Java and Go that allows you kind of take the binary to run it everywhere? Yeah, many of you, right? So what's nice about this DBBPF is a program loader, right? It allows you to kind of write the kernel and use a space program in C, and then you can compile them in advance. So as long as you have like kernel level, you can run them and execute the program. So uh, the compiled binary has your eBPF program compiled, so it's ready to go. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass uh, the mic to Dini to show us a demo on this. Yes, yeah, thanks, Lin. So I'll try to do with one end. I struggle, I'll tell you. So obviously, the goal here is, uh, oh, why we go that? That's fine. It's OK. So the goal is not to do like a, a full demo of libbpf, right? But just uh, because we are going to show you how we can do observability in Kubernetes with uh, eBPF, uh, what we wanted to do is to just start by um, what is the foundation, right? If you want to do observability, you want to know which service talk to which service, you need to get the source IP and target IP of the network uh, communications happening. And there is like this TCP connect uh, example that is quite straightforward that you can uh, use to get this data. And uh, the first way you can do it by using like this tooling like libbpf and Cori. So I'm going to start with this. And then Lin is going to show you or to explain uh, what we contributed to the community with this Bumblebee project. And then I'm going to do the same program with uh, Bumblebee. And then we are going to do step by step ability from there. So what we have here is this, um, uh, two f these two files, right? We have the kernel uh, file here, right? That's this, uh, what we want to, this is the BPF program that we want to load in the kernel. And as you can see, there is a hash map that has the key is the, this struct. So the source IP and the IP address. The value is the number of uh, requests that correspond to this uh, pair, basically. And then what we want is just displaying this information, right? We want to display source IP, destination IP, number of requests. And just to do that, you need to write this complex program in C as well, right? So it's a lot of lines of code if you think about it just to display what I get from the, the kernel program. So I'm going to do that so that uh, we have one working example. And after that, uh, I'm going to, uh, we are going to do the same in, uh, in another way. So let's start by this. Um, to just copy these files that have, uh, so let me go to this directory here. I'll do a lot of copy and paste, so that should be good with one end. That will be my first uh, one ended uh, demo uh, live, right? So let's try. And so I just take these files in my current directory. And uh, when you have, obviously, in this environment, I have all the prerequisites, so that seems very easy to do. The most difficult would be probably to have all these prerequisites, like the kernel headers and all the stuff. But I get them. So here, I just need to do a make TCP connect, and it just build this binary that has the user program and the program that the user program has. Uh, it, and then executing this binary and I should start to see some source address target address, and the number of calls as you can see here right and it will display every so it's really basic foundation for what we are going to demonstrate about this Kubernetes uh, observability so up to you now Lin to explain that we can do it a different way than what we uh, explained with uh, libbpf, right? Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me? Is the microphone good, better, hopefully? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this really got us thinking, right? What if we could only write the kernel program and don't need to worry about the user space program? How many of you like Docker and the Docker experience? Well, Docker CLI can use 
uh, oh. push, build, right? So only four people in the entire room like the Docker experience where you can push, pull, build, and so on. That's what I, I can see, right? How many people are using Docker today? <laughs> Don't be shy, right? I okay, mean, a Docker bit more. brings container to us, right? So this is where Bumblebee comes in. By the way, I know the screen is a little bit tiny, so if you scan that QR code, you will be able to visit bumblebee.io. So essentially, Bumblebee provides a Docker-like experience to eBPF to you to enable you to easily uh, build your eBPF program to be able to publish your program to your OCI registry and be able to have somebody else, or could be you, run the program by pulling the images from the OCI registry. So essentially, what Bumblebee does is allow you to focus on writing eBPF program. And Bumblebee provides the user program for you and generates the permissive metrics for your user pro uh, for your uh, for your user pro uh, for your metrics uh, if in permissive format automatically for you. So um, so it's a really nice way for you to get started with uh, eBPF and start learning eBPF. Here at Solo, we find out uh, learning eBPF is hard, um, and we spend a lot of time uh, debugging eBPF programs, so we decided to open source Bumblebee. In fact, uh, a couple of maintainers from Bumblebee sit right uh, in the table in front of me. Uh, next, I'm going to pass to Dini to show us an interesting demo about Bumblebee. Be. Thanks, Lin. So, uh, so yeah, I think that what uh, Lin was highlighting is the fact that uh, you have uh, obviously some cases where writing a user program makes sense because you want to have like a bi-directional communication with the kernel program. But when it comes to observability, it's not that true, right? In terms of observability, we've seen a use case before where you can filter out some of the stuff in the kernel, but whatever you read program, you just want to display it or to process it in a simple way, right? So that's why this idea of having the user program uh, built for you. So let me go back here and go to the next steps. Where we use like instruct for that and we have like a workshop where you can go through all this one by one and we, we go through that, uh, deliver that workshop very often. So if you're interested, just take a look at uh, our website. So now, first thing I'm going to do is just uh, getting this Bumblebee CLI. Oops. So just copy and paste this. And uh, so the first benefit you will see is that I don't need to worry about prerequisites, right? I don't care about. Uh, oh. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes? OK, cool, thanks. So you don't need to worry anymore about your prerequisites, right? What you need is just Docker. It's quite easy, right? Uh, obviously, you have like some uh, kernel uh, requirements when you load it. But to compile it, it's really you just need Docker, right? And uh, you get this CLI. And then you could run a B in it to just have a skeleton created for you. I want to have a C program for network uh, use case, and you will get a skeleton. Here, we are not going to do that. Here, what we are going to do, we are going to use another file that is very similar to the one before. So you remember before, we had this kernel program here. And now, we are going to use this one just here. It looks the same, right? And to show you that it's really similar, I'm just going to do a diff here of the two files. So the file that we used with libbpf before, at the file we use right now. So let me try to paste this. No. No, that's fine, thanks. But that should be. <laughs> thanks. Just trying to understand why it doesn't do like a copy. <laughs> that's always this funny. I, I got like a. Some uh, strange demo effect sometimes, but never like the copy and paste not working. But no worries, we'll find it. <laughs> Perhaps it's the Wi Fi that is not very happy again. So, the good news I have a plan B. 
already in place. So give me one second. I'm switching to my phone, and that should be better. Yeah, it's always the Wi-Fi. Yeah, smart switch. Let's go there. Cool. It will not be as fast, but it will be more reliable, I think. OK, so I need to export this again. Paste it. And then I should be able this time to do a copy and paste, hopefully. Copy and paste. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it was really just long. OK, cool. So what's the difference, you see? Really minor, right? So what I want to highlight is that you can take whatever um, source code that you have for libbpf. You take just the kernel program. You forget about the user program. You take the, f the, the, the kernel program. And you just have this naming convention that if I want the user program to treat this hash map as a counter, I just add dot counter. That should be, everyone should be able to do it, right? So it's, it's really straightforward. Uh, so let's do it now. I'm copying this file to my uh, current directory. OK. Copy. I love this network. Let me try to do in this one. Yeah. And I'm going to run this command. You see it's a B build. So basically it's like you build this file. Oh, yeah, I am not having this in my I'm not having this in my pass here. Copy. Bear with me. We'll do it. So you see, I just say I want to build this program. And you can see the, the, the format of the second argument is like a, really like a, a Docker image, right? Like a OCI uh, image, right? So localhost 5000 means that I run my registry locally. And solo is my repository. And TCP connect my uh, image name and v1 the tag, right? And uh, if it's like localhost 5000, it's because obviously I have my registry r running uh, locally in my, uh, in my machine, right? So hopefully my network will be able to give me, move me to m next step. That will be challenging with this network. Let's try again. So, okay. Export this again. Now it is built anyway, so that's fine. So the next thing I want to do when I build it is to push it. You know, it's like the Docker experience, right? You do a build with a Docker file. Here you do a build with like a, a BPF program. And then you do like a B push, which basically will push this to my registry that is running in my local machine here. And finally, I can do a B run that will simply run this program from my image. And you can see very similar to what we've seen before, right? A little bit nicer UI, but I will not tell you that the value is to have this UI. The value is just that I didn't write any code, right, to get this UI. And the thing that I really like about it, in fact, is not really the UI per se, is really the fact that it exposes automatically all this data uh, as Prometheus metrics or Prometheus format metrics, right? So now I can go to this endpoint, and I can see the data, the exactly the same data that I, I can see in my UI here available as metrics, right? So you remember, we said the goal is to show you this Kubernetes observability from the beginning. So we, are, we have achieved the first piece, right? We have now a program that we can load from anywhere and that can give, you, give us like, information about the source and the target IP. So what we are going to do next is uh, pretty simple. We are going to um, run um, like a daemon set that is going to deploy this program in all of my Kubernetes nodes so that I don't gather just the information for my local machine, but I gather the information for all the different Kubernetes nodes. 
Then we are going to use Prometheus to capture this matrix, and we are going to display a nice graph at the end. So to do that, we just deploy like a, uh, a demo application. A lot of people are probably familiar with this uh, book info application. If you are not, it's very easy. It's just like a, an application that is composed of multiple microservices that talk together, right? So just if you want to show a graph of services communicating together, you need to have these services. So that's why we use this example. And if I look at uh, this uh, kubectl get pods, I use the minus o wide. It's just to show you that uh, we have uh, these containers that are deployed in multiple nodes, right? You see master, worker one, and worker two. Just to show that we are going to be able to display a graph with these communications happening in uh, different nodes. And the machine where I am right now, you see it's called root at master. So I am right now in SSH of the master where I have this image that I push to the registry. You remember I told you about the registry? So if I do a docker ps, you can see here that I have my registry running, right? So my, my uh, uh, BPF program is already loaded there. So next step is deploying Prometheus because I want to persist my metrics, right? I just don't want to have them in real time. I want to persist them so that I can build a graph as it is now, but I could build a graph as, uh, as it is in the last like one hour or two hours or whatever like that, right? So I'm going to really do a very simple deployment of Prometheus, right? So really the basic uh, community version of, uh, of Prometheus. And after that, I'm going to deploy this uh, Bumblebee image as a daemon set. But what will be surprising for you at the beginning is that I'm not going to run the image I built because it's not a Docker image what I built. What I built is an OCI compliant image that contains my eBPF program. So I'm going to run a daemon set where it has a do it's, it's a Docker image that has this BCLI and the argument of this uh, command that it's called B is where it can find my image, right? So it's not that you run the BPF program as a Docker image, right? It's really like the B program itself runs as a Docker image, right? So you can really uh, distribute your, uh, you can build your uh, eBPF program and then you can distribute it through a registry. So if you have OCI registry, which is the case of most of the people today, then you can use it to distribute your program across uh, many different machines. Okay, that's not what I want to copy. So it's like a second act of uh, this copy and paste problem. Let's try it again. Yeah. So I run it as a daemon set and I create a pod monitor. So for people who are familiar with Prometheus, it's a way to tell Prometheus, go and scrap the metrics from this pod, right? So I have this daemon set. So I have one pod per cluster or per node. And it exposes these metrics like I have shown you before, right? It exposes these metrics uh, natively. So I'm just going to tell Prometheus to go and capture these metrics here. That's kind of the modern way to do it. A, a lot of you perhaps are more familiar with like uh, annotation that you put in the pods. That's like the old way. And the new way is really like you create a pod monitor and you, you declaratively say, you know, what you want to, to scrap. And finally, I'm going to generate traffic, right? So I'm just going to go into my uh, front end of the uh, book info application that's called product page. And this product page will call the other services, right? So just generating some traffic because now that I have my eBPF program loaded on each node, I have my Prometheus cluster that captured this data. Now I want to generate traffic, right? So that I have data in my Prometheus cluster. The last step is I'm going to, I, I built a very small program, a small UI that does two things. It's connect to the Prometheus uh, cluster to get all these metrics. So it will get things like source IP, destination IP, number of requests. But the problem is that nobody cares about source. If I build you a graph that says this IP talk to this IP, you don't really care, right? What you want is a pod talking to a service, right? Because if you look at the source and target IP, the source IP is a pod IP in the Kubernetes world. 
and the target IP is a service IP in general in the Kubernetes world, right? So what this program will do is that it will also connect to the Kubernetes API server to correlate all this data, right? So that's why I create this cluster role binding to tell that my program is allowed to talk to the uh, Kubernetes API server, basically. And finally, I can deploy this demo application that is going to make the magic happen, hopefully. So I paste this here. I can take a look at my uh, pods running here. So it's still uh, creating it. But you can see already uh, the Bumblebee program. You see three pods because I have the master, the worker one, and worker two. Okay. So again, just waiting for it to be ready. It's running. So now I can go there. And that works. So I can see here basically that I have like, uh, so let me like change again. And if, in fact, what's funny is that if I refresh, I will have even more data because I will have the, the program itself trying to get the data from Prometheus and so on, right? So you can see here, for example, for people who are familiar with the product page, I can see the product page talk to, or the product page pod talk to the service review, which is composed of these two pods that call to the rating service. And I can see, for example, here, right, that I have my KBPF program, the one that displays everything, that talk to uh, the Prometheus server here and talk to this Kubernetes API server to be able to display this graph, right? So that's it. I don't think we have a, uh, do we have a closing slide? I'm not sure. Let me check. But uh, I think that was mostly it, right? That's what we done. And uh, across nodes, that just give you a, an overview of it. And as I said, uh, we have this uh, workshop where you start from zero and you do that by yourself. Uh, so don't, don't hesitate to register. We run that like every month uh, across uh, different time zones. So thanks, yeah. uh, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Great job. Well, shout out to Dini on an awesome demo. If you are interested uh, to do the demo on your laptop, check out solo.io slash events. Uh, we offer these uh, badges every month. Also, check out Bumblebee using the QR code. Thank you very much. Right, who has some questions for Lynn and Dennis? Question, question? Must be some questions. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll ask a question to you lot. Has anybody here already tried using Bumblebee? There's a hand. Yeah, OK, good. <laughs> yeah. All right, last call for questions. We got one oh, question. Oh, great. <laughs> Hello. Um, are you familiar with the eBPF exporter from Cloudflare? I no. Uh. Uh, yes, a little bit. Uh, we've read uh, the <laughs> GitHub page. I haven't personally tried it. Yeah, so I think what this really adds on top of that is the idea behind pushing it on to a, uh, like packaging it as an OCI image and you know pushing it to an OCI registry. But I think the like underlying concept. Uh, seems to be very similar to me, and you know, I'm really excited to see this. Uh, but one question that I had on this was, uh, when you're deploying it as a daemon set, do you have to like for every single like probe or a program that you write, you have, do you have to create a separate daemon set for it, or can you package multiple ones together and say pull this set of images and just deploy that as one, yeah. one like uh, whole? Can you hear me? Yeah. So I think that you know what we did here, like the daemon set and the being able to show you the Kubernetes thing, was just an excuse to show you like a real use case instead of a program that would just display some you know boring information, right? The, so the, the goal of the project is not to simplify the way you are going to deploy in production 
or managing the life cycle of this program. The goal of the Bumblebee is really to simplify the, the way you can go from writing your code to building your code to making it available for production, right? And what you're asking about is probably what's happening just after, right? I have now my image in my registry. What tooling I use to run these different things in parallel or whatever. But this is not something that is in the scope of the, of the project right now. The, the, it's like uh, if you look at Docker, right? You will push your image, and then Kubernetes came to try to solve all these other problems, right? So it's kind of the same. Perhaps there will be a Kubernetes of eBPF because there are, will be so many eBPF programs running in the same machine that you want to tackle all these things. But that's definitely not the scope of the project today. Another question? Yes. Uh, thanks. Um, I really love the way you do with the OCI compliant image for distributing. But my question will be there some kind of mechanism to um, to check them, maybe to sign them to say, OK, it, so it doesn't become something like I can download whatever thing, malicious eBPF programs, for example, to say, will there be something provided? Because now you are runtime. And uh, I can already imagine my developers going crazy, downloading stuff like in the wild dogger times. Uh, things from strange dude 200 and run it on a production cluster yeah that's a good question i think that's why we we basically w what we expect is people will use like a, a public registry when they play with it and they want to try out stuff in their laptop right but we don't expect people will allow users to run uh, packages coming from a public registry and it's quite easy to block that right so we expect customers to use their own local artifactory or local registry that is OCI compliant and to manage that kind of policies, right? Yeah. I feel like I should also add there, there is some work going on in the BPF community around the signing of BPF programs. I think that's definitely a work in progress. Yeah. Just to add to that, um, because we use OCI, you can sign it like any other image. Um, so, yeah. It would be nice when the runtime would check this and say, OK, is it signed? Who signed it? And then to be sure, as you said, only corporate signed stuff can be run. So you protect this in before. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that's what the, the kernel BPF signing work is, is about. Yeah. Uh, question, any more questions? Um, yes. Do you plan to support any other languages than, than C? Yeah, I think we discussed about Rust as the, something that was asked. But uh, I mean, like it's uh, definitely an open source project. We want people to participate. So feel free to open issues there if you have preference and so on, right? That's definitely the idea. I think, uh, yeah, you wanted to add something? So maybe I will add, I'm indeed I'm the founder of Solo. I mean, um, this project idea was to help the community, right? We using it internally, we thought that it will help a lot to the community, so we open source it. The purpose is to bring it to the CNCF. We are in the process right now to basically uh, put it as a project you know, in, a, in the CNCF. We are not planning to keep it for ourselves. So as I said, like, please come help us make it successful. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that's all of them.